Well, welcome to the October 16, 2019 meeting of the Community Preservation Committee on this rainy night. As always, we begin with general public comment. If any folks would like to speak about any issue other than what's other than presenters who are presenting, now's your chance. Nobody? Okay. Uh, we have one set of minutes to approve. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes of March the 6th? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, moving right along. Uh, so tonight, as everyone knows, is our chance to hear from you, the project managers or project inventors or whatever you call yourselves. Uh, we have seven different projects before us for this round. The total ask is $1.1 million uh, from all seven of those projects. The amount available to us, and this is still an estimate, we still don't have our state match in quite yet, is $946,000. And that's for both the fall and the spring. So that's the total fiscal year uh, allocation for us. So again, let me just state that 1.1 million in requests just for this grant, and 946,000 that we can spend for both rounds. So we'd say this because um, wouldn't it be nice to be able to fund everyone all the time? But that's not the case, uh, and we want you to be aware of the fiscal constraints that 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 we are under. Um, of that 946,000, the way the CPC works is that 50% is taken, 15, right? Uh, 10. Thank you. 10% is taken out of that for uh, each of the three different reserves. There is a reserve for open space, a reserve for historic preservation, a reserve for affordable housing. So $172,000 has got to be locked in for each of those three things. You can say, or you may ask, well, why is uh, 1.1 million, 10% is not 172,000. But a lot of what we've allocated already are projects that, were, that, that are out there that we're bonding. So some of the money available to us is not discretionary now. We're obligated to fund Florence Fields, Pulaski Park, Bean Farm, we're still sending that, that money. Okay. Uh, so what we're doing today is uh, going in the order that Sarah gave us. Um, and I'm going to play timekeeper, and we're going to get through all seven projects in this meeting. So forgive me if I do the slashing motion. We're going to give each folks folk, uh, 15 minutes, and that's not much. But rest assured, number one, we've read your proposals. We'd have a chance to ask questions that have been submitted to you and your answers have come back. In a couple cases, we have, uh, we've gone on site visits as well. So it's, we're not seeing your presentation blind and not knowing, uh, knowing what it is. Two weeks from tonight, November the, whatever that first Wednesday is in November. Three weeks. Three weeks. Yep. Um, Last week. Oh, that's right. Three weeks from tonight, we'll be hearing from the general public uh, comments about these proposals. So get your peeps here uh, for the 7 o'clock show, and sometimes we have standing room only a full house. But it's really useful for us to hear what, uh, what people have to say for or against the proposal. Um, so please do your part in getting interested people that you think would speak to your proposal uh, here so we can we can listen to that. We then begin deliberations, perhaps that evening, but depends on how many people show up, and then extending into our usual meeting, which is the, would be the third Wednesday in November, in the hopes that we can wrap this all up by the first Wednesday in December. Again, we are an advisory board. We send our advice out to city council and to the mayor and they almost always do what we say. So with very, very rare exceptions, which I can think of one. So without further ado, and again, forgive me for watching the clock here, which I'm gonna do 
and, uh, and cutting you off at 15 minutes. So we're going to begin with the North ha uh, Northampton Housing Authority, the Hampshire Heights uh, place. Hello, committee members. My name is Jack Redman. I am the senior property manager at the Northampton Housing Authority. I oversee the public housing and Section 8 departments. And to my right is Natanya. Natanya is our resident services coordinator who works directly with our families every day. Um, the application that we've submitted um, is for play space for recreation for our families at the Hampshire Heights community located at 241 Jackson Street. Um, this project has um, really grown since we started. Um, last year, the, through Healthy Hampshire and um, Grow Food Northampton, our residents had the um, luxury of having garden beds built in one location at our property. And we found over having many of the families participate that our children are coming out to the event to support their parents, but after five or 10 minutes, have nothing else to do. And so um, with that, um, we ask that you fund the, the amount that we're looking for, which is 150,000. Um, we've seen your questions that you've asked and we, um, we still have some, some bidding out to do to get to a final number. Uh, but I can't stress the importance of how much our low-income families are looking for a place where they can spend time with their families, where they can go out and play and um, do the physical aspects that um, they require to develop. Natanya Ortiz is our resident services coordinator. She's going to just talk briefly about... <coughs> Um, one example of why it's so important for the community and the families that we serve. Um, so I work directly at Hampshire Heights. I'm usually there after school. I leave later than the usual people in the office. Um, so I do see the kids every time they're just outside looking for something to do. Um, we recently put some picnic tables out for some lunches that we were having in the summer. Um, we haven't had the heart to take them out because <laughs> the kids use them. Um, they're putting blankets on it, trampolines, you name it, I've seen it. Um, just using their imagination because they don't have anything to play with there. Um, usually parents don't have transportation or there's one person watching all the kids because everyone looks out for each other. Um, so they don't really have the means to go somewhere else to another park. So having something there would be, really be beneficial for them. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Uh, questions? Is there an age range that you're targeting or several age ranges? You may, you may have said in your application, but I don't recall that. Yeah, so 52% of our residents at Hampshire Heights are uh, children. And so between 6 and 12, um, about half of the kids are that age range. So in addition to incorporating an accessible feature to the playground, that was our main target, um, was the six to 12 range. Uh, I heard you ask for 150,000. I see the request on my proposal at 200. Oh, I apologize. I'm sorry. We, we've received commitment from CDBG for 150,000. Unfortunately, the amount of money that is there um, does not allow us to complete the playground project in its entirety. And so that's why we're seeking the remaining funding from you. I apologize, I misspoke. So it is 200. It is 200. Other questions? The, the, the pictures that you su um, supplied in the application do show a few is isolated playground pieces of equipment you know when those date from so the few that are there so the basketball court is that what you're referencing uh, there was just like an isolated it looked like some kind of a climbing yeah it's just like a monkey bar that's really so anything that's there to our knowledge is from the the um, an original building um, 1950 1951 yeah, yeah. 
Other questions? Can you tell me about the basketball court? And that's that's not part of this proposal, as I understand it. Is that usable? So the because I'm just wondering about the kids who are 12 and older. And yeah. So the the basketball court right now does need a little bit of work. Um, it's not. Um, the kids are still using it right now, um, but um, the main focus is that the younger kids, six to 12, that just don't have a place to go. And so in the, as we finalize the components of the actual pieces of equipment, which aren't finalized, um, we will look to see based on the budget if we can incorporate some of those components for an older age group. Have you explored, I mean, this is so close to Jackson Street, which has a brand new playground, has two playgrounds. Have you explored any, in the interim, like ways to get kids or keep kids? I mean, there are after school programs at Jackson Street. I don't know, the weekend is different, you know. Have you explored like a service, a program that just to make that, I mean, it's, it's like half a buck. Yeah, so for, for our families, the, the difficulty is, is that during the week, the, the children aren't allowed to use the playground while the after school program is in session. So most of our families that are the optimum time for our families and children to use the playground is right after school between that 3.30 and six o'clock time range when mm -hmm. the parents are oftentimes, you know, making dinner, preparing the kids to start their homework. And so for them to have to go that distance to Jackson Street, which I understand for many is, is not that difficult, but when it, we have a lot of single parent households that- Well, the, presumably these are kids who are going to Jackson Street. Um, yes, we have we have students also at JFK, or all Jackson Street. Um, and so um, we can certainly look further into- It's into not a program other, that you have though. Yeah, we don't have, we have started through the Grow Food Northampton, um, trying to engage the families and the children in other ways. Um, actually, every Wednesday right now, uh, we have a cooking class in our community room. And so the, the kids are coming out um, for a period, period of time, but they're really looking to engage in some physical activity that, you know, they're, they're in the classroom most of the day. And so they really look to run around and not sit with cooking, you know, unfortunately. And I think it's important to just point out that at this time the parents are inside, they're, you know, preparing lunch or, you know, single parents, a lot of, there'll be like one um, resident that'll watch all the kids rather than the parents actually being able to leave and take the kids somewhere. It's easier for them to be, you know, have one person that maybe isn't the single parent or doesn't have those duties to kind of watch all the kids and kind of look out for each other. And that's the response I get when I ask them why I don't they go over there. What would be the ramifications of not fully funded? Would the, could the project proceed without us fully funding you or is 200,000 got to have that? Yeah, the, the difficulty is is the, the 150000 and the 14000 that Northampton Housing is able to contribute um, really goes for the foundation of the playground. And so the, the actual play pieces um, are what the bulk of the rest of the funding that we need. And so we can, there, there's minimal that we're going to be able to do, if anything, with just the 150000 that CDBG is giving us. <clears throat> Other than we could buy <clears throat> twenty five thousand for the LSI Globe motion spinner, so perhaps one of those big pieces of equipment might not be able to be funded, but the rest could be funded and installed. Okay. Yeah, the the most amount of funding that you guys are able to give will, will of help us, of, of course. course. And so we will go back to the drawing board once we have. The final number to see if there's anything else that that could be cut, um, but we we've, we've brought the price down, believe it or not, uh, mm -hmm. and so we're we really tried to give you a minimalist that we could come up with. Do you have an 
idea of what the lifespan of the playground would be and also just how it's going to be maintained? Sure, so the, the architect that we were working on um, had, had mentioned between 15 and 30 years, depending on the, the components. And so um, the housing authority is fully committed to ongoing maintenance. We do have maintenance staff at the property assigned to Hampshire Heights that uh, will go through the upkeep when these components are installed and will ensure that they're on a preventative maintenance schedule. Uh, and that also we don't have any other plans for that area. Surface intended surface for the playground. So the, there were there were several different surfaces that um, were presented to us. Um, we uh, we went with one that was sort of mid um, price range so that there was durability there. Uh, we may have to look at that a little bit further depending on the final number. And what was that choice? Um, I have to. I don't have it in front of me, but it was a. Um, it was um, there's a there's a really high quality rubber and then there was a there was one that was a step down uh, and I believe that's the one that um, we budgeted for. Any other questions? Thank you both. So Thank much. you again for your time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up is uh, historic. Okay. I'm Laurie Sanders, one of the co-directors, and I'm Betty Sharp, the other co-director. So thank you all so much for coming the other day. We're crossing our fingers with the technology. Well, it's curious because just a few minutes ago we. we yeah, we are. We work. It worked. We are cursed in this. Mm. It up, I guess. <laughs> Clock's not ticking, right, Brian? Clock is not. <laughs> <laughs> Review. Um, everyone was there the other night, and we had previously submitted um, a, a kind of a summary of one of our earlier reports of the changes that have happened um, with previous CPC funding. But as as you know, during the last year, um, we have a new exhibit. But in the in the last four years, Betty and I came on three years ago, and in the last uh, since 2014, there has been really a dramatic number of changes at the Stuart Park Hampton, and those are listed in, in Appendix 1. But, you know, they range from structural stabilization work as well as uh, organization and improvements to the collections, and, and then also um, lots of improvements to the outside grounds. And, and a lot of that is with contractors, but, but also a tremendous amount of work has come from volunteers in the community. And, uh, so just, just to put things in perspective, we have currently about 600 active members and donors. Um, we have more than 100 volunteers from the community who um, have participated and, and regularly participate. Since we started, we have developed an active uh, internship program. Until this, this year, it was all college students, but we have a, a new person working with us, and she's reached out, so we have a number of students from Northampton uh, Public High School as well as from uh, the PVPA. So that's, that's a nice addition for us. Programming, uh, five or six years ago, it was about eight programs a year with about 120 members. Now we have about <coughs> 50 programs a year. Uh, last year we had more than 4,000 people attend. 
the other thing I think, um, which many of you are familiar with, we, it's been really wonderful, all the collaborations that have happened from uh, working with our neighbors at Ward 3 to having groups like uh, Girls on the Run, Youth Historic Northampton, us going at other places in the community too. So um, as we shared with, with you the other day, we have a new uh, program initiative for schools. And in fact, uh, Historic Northampton just today is the deadline for uh, Northampton Education Foundation. And we submitted a proposal. Uh, there are seven teachers who are interested in having classroom visits. And then uh, out teachers, third grade teachers from four of the elementary schools have um, requested collaboration. And just since June, this is big for us, <coughs> more than 3,000 people uh, attend uh, our programs and, and visit our grounds, which is historic in and of itself. Um, so we're really focused on being a community-centered museum. And that's what, and, and in, in addition, the other key component of our mission is preserving the artifacts that are under our control. And that includes not only uh, tangible items, but, but the houses and buildings themselves. So our our goal, broadly, in terms of you know what what we hope to be for the community is not only a, a center where people feel welcome, all people, but also that we really play a vital role in in Northampton as a, as becoming a destination and having a regional net reputation and uh, by golly, if we can, a national reputation. Um, and, and I honestly, because the history of Northampton is so extraordinary, I, I don't think that's an impossible, impossible reach. So that we have four four projects that we identified, um, and one of the questions was, you know, sort of wh why these four are there are there things that uh, we can put off, and we we winnow through the the priorities and and. Um, Previously, uh, so this is, the barn is the largest project, and as I shared with um, everyone, Maury was here, Maury's there, but we are working with this consultant team, and this proposal in some ways came before you in 2015, but at that point, uh, there was an idea of like, well, what can, what can we do with the barn? And I think one of the things that's really exciting now in the trajectory of historic Northampton is that we have a, with the, the buildings are stable, the collections are well organized, we have a new beautiful exhibit, and so this is really the, the next, next big step. And, uh, and I feel for the community there are lots of different benefits, and certainly for the institution. So Many of you have seen the interior of the barn. You know, we're up against a little bit of uh, stuff on the inside, <laughs> but um, but with the previously uh, Alicia Spence, who you met the other day, she had done a structural assessment that came in in an earlier proposal to um, the CPC. And at that time, one of the questions was, you know, there was a lot of like, well, well, we think it's a pretty old barn. We know it's a pretty old barn, but we don't really know how old it is. And so with a small grant from the CPC, uh, we hired Bill Flint, and he determined through this uh, dendrochronology the age, which is 1805-06. One of the things that I think makes the barn is going to be this wonderful additional resource for us is that, as you can see in this picture of the pathway, it's, it go, you can easily go from our building. It's a small campus. It's two and a half acres. So, it's a, it's a natural addition, and it'll be a way to use the property more, more effectively. In the future, aside from um, rest restoring the barn and allowing people, allowing the public in it, it'll be a nice way, as Betty mentioned the other day, for us to display some of the extraordinary signs that we have. We have a few different weather vanes. We just received the bell from the courthouse, um, and uh, potentially those those could be there. With, we work with an electrician who you'll see at the end um, who uh, has done a lot of work with theater and lighting design, so has a lot of expertise there. The L is, is 
going to be a wonderful place for us to have classroom activities, things that are messy, things that we can't do in, the, in our current space. And I think one of the things that's really nice is about it as well is that it's right adjacent to where the Bridge Street school kids have their program. So let's say it's in Clement weather, they can, they can go in there, there's an ADA bathroom. If we're starting field trips, and again, the weather isn't so hot, uh, we can also have concerts there. There's a lot of possibilities for the way that space can be used. And, and, and furthermore, as I mentioned what, during the site visit, I think one of the other benefits is this little nook could be secured so that community groups could use it outside of historic mm -hmm. Northampton hours. So that's a benefit broadly for others, and if we can charge a little rent money, it's also a, a, a small economic component for our financial um, picture. Then there's the Parsons House, which Betty is going to um, describe more about mm -hmm. that, that piece. Mm -hmm. So the Parsons House is the dendrochronology says it's uh, 1719, which makes it one of the, if not the earliest house in Northampton, one of them. And the exciting thing is, is it's on its same location and its original structure are the two rooms or the two rooms in the front. So they're all there. Um, in the early 1990s, um, a, an excellent historic structures report was done by a group from the Society for the Preservation of New England Antiquities, which is now called Historic New England. They did a phenomenal job. And um, over the last few years, I've asked several experts, should we have that study be done? And they all said, you don't need to do that. It's just, these people are excellent. Use that as your basis. Get a little more information and up to date, but, but that's just well done. So I'm showing you a couple pictures here from the, um, the, one of the rooms on the first floor, the one to the right as you enter, which was originally the kitchen, and then it became the parlor. And those, all those colors on the left, those was the first bunch of, the, the first um, um, paper, wallpapering and painting that was done. And then about 10, 15 years later, it was done again. But all those remnants are there. And where you see there's wood, all those places are exposed now and they're covered with plexiglass. So when we want to do a kind of a tour or something, all that building archeology span is still right there. It's just that the house had been closed to the public since 2007. So um, we'll build, be building on that. And one of the things that I find most exciting about this house in terms of how people will see it is I think about what the, what the house has seen through its windows. Who has walked by? Who maybe has gone in? What has happened over all those years uh, in Northampton? All right. So. What we will ask to do is to conduct this top to bottom assessment with a, a group of experts, and we've described them in the, um, in the proposal. And they will <clears throat> talk about what we can remove, what we can't remove, um, how we can make it most original and, and um, available to the public. What kinds of <clears throat> repairs, we weren't specific about all the repairs because we know that some of them will be uncovered and will be um, described to us through their report. Um, Laurie, why don't you talk about how we plan to use the spaces? Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are the, the number one is the, is the part of the house that's closest to the road. That would be the section that would be open to the public. Number two on this is the back two rooms that I mentioned to you that we're hoping to convert that into a short-term residential space for historians, scholars, artists, not only in our case to support our mission, but then as a short-term residence space for, let's say, the Arts Trust or one of the, one of the colleges. And then room three, it's, it's kind of a question mark, but one of the, one of the projects that both um, Ford's Library and Smith College, and we've all started our series of oral histories uh, with people. And in fact, we have another oral history recording on Monday. And <clears throat> so to one possibility is that we could set this room aside as a space where people could record, where we as staff could record our oral histories, but it could become a little bit like a small story score, story core space where the public could, re could record their 
Um, the, la the last project is, uh, this is uh, the repair of the porch on the Shepherd House, and there are these two historic images on the <coughs> from 1904. And I, I wanted to include those just so you see that the porch, although there's been lots of repairs on the floor, the columns are the same, and even the stairs uh, are the same uh, for more than a century. So the fellow in the photograph is Tom Hallisey. He works with a, a, a um, carpenter, that, a contractor that we work with named Douglas Thayer. And so he did an inspection there, which I mentioned to all of you, but as I also said, is he brought his cell phone and um, we've made some minor repairs because there's quite a bit of rot right at the beginning, but by opening up the floorboard and sticking a cell phone in and spinning it around, that was how we were able to get a clear sense of the foundation. And so things were much better. So the cost of this, which uh, two different contractors just kind of looking at it before this work was done, they said, oh, 30000 So needless to say, um, this was... A, a great uh, addition, or great news to us. Uh, and the, the last piece is um, <coughs> we brought everyone down into the into our collection storage in Damon, where we have this framing wall. We didn't go upstairs. This is how the other framed art is currently curated, <coughs> uh, which is on the floor of the second floor <coughs> of the Parsons house, which obviously is not uh, up to museum standards, let me just say that. So the proposal here is to build another art rack that would go in front of the of the existing art rack. Um, so we've requested, oh, here's our team. Uh, Greg Farmer and Myron Sacco would be the preservation consultants, and some of you know these other folks. Douglas Stair, Alicia Spence was there the other day. And Wade Clement is our electrician who worked with us on the lighting design and installation for our new exhibit. And all of these, the three contractors have all worked together uh, as well. So it's it's just like for us, it's a dream team. They're, they're, they're exceedingly talented, um, have all worked with historic structures and um, and are uh, easy to work with. And, and they, they really are mindful of, of uh, our budget um, and schedule. So we've requested $191,000 from the CPC for total budget um, of $250,000, uh, or $251,000 more or less, and with our historic North Hampton share being $50,000. So um, we have just a couple minutes left. Uh, questions for so, so with Parsons House, the goal of this study is to come up with a budget for the actual project. Is that right? Or this is for this price, you couldn't actually make it. You couldn't open it with thirty-seven thousand dollars. Well, we hope to. I mean, the goal is to spend twenty-five thousand on the assessment and um, about ten or so on kind of easy enough repairs for the first for for the entryway and the two full. Um, front rooms. I hope that we can. Yeah, but I think um, Greg Farmer, one of our consultants, walked through all these spaces with us, and he's the one who said, "You, you have everything. Uh, you don't, you know, you have to make some repairs, but you don't have a long way to go before you reopen to the public." There is quite a bit of. Um, a number of artifacts that are stored on the first floor and some other repairs. But we've hired a part-time collections manager and so that that with the compact storage has made a big difference. And so, you know, for the short term, we can take some of those items and now we have a little bit more space upstairs. Um, but he was very optimistic that we, that we could open it to the public, and I, that's our that's our goal. It's yeah. been closed since 2007. Yeah, it's a safe space, so you could open it. You, um, that does not include, <coughs> if I left the impression that we would restore it to those wallpapers and those paints and stuff. No, that's not that. 
that's just cleaning it up enough and probably taking down the track lightings and things like that so that you can open it to the public. And then the question is, what do you do with it, right? So I think what we would do is we would let people in, we would talk to people, we would do some school groups, we'd do some looking around at the um, building archaeology, and then we'd really figure out what we want to do with it. Because I don't think it would be right for us to decide right now we're going to restore it to X, um, you know, certain period or a certain kind of look or something. Let's figure that out, but get it open enough so that we can then work toward that next step. Uh, do you have an ADA compliance problem with that? Is it, are, they, are they accessible? Is it accessible? Um, it's, it's, it's that side door. Yeah, right? the side door. Louis has, worked, has been out to the side, yeah. and so um we we've, we've discussed that with them and as and there's provision within the state regulations that that al allow for historic structures as you know mm -hmm. i'm sure to have flexibility mm -hmm. there's some waivers and based on the number of people who would come in and we would only be doing things on that first floor right so we'd be so okay so you could get in on the first floor on the side floor it's part of the reason we redesigned the parking lot that way so we actually have a handicapped space right close yeah. Yeah. to where that access point would be okay. <clears throat> i'm afraid we're gonna have to cut things off on that thank you so, okay. so much just real quickly before you go on page 18 your budget I don't know if you have there right there. There are some miscalculations in that piece that you might want to look at. Oh, great. Okay, Thanks. so Thanks, George. look at that. So maybe you could save some money there. Um, the Excel spreadsheet just didn't total up. Didn't total up. Okay. Right. Oh, okay. And great. if that Thanks. is the case, perhaps getting us a, a revision. A revision <laughs> okay. Good. Thank you so much. Uh, next up is Forbes Library. Brian, I'm going to be recusing myself from this. Um, us here tonight. I'm uh, Lisa Downing, the library director, and I have Molly Moss, assistant director, and Jason Putz, and facilities man manager, who will answer questions that I'm unable to answer. Um, so we are uh, seeking funding to hire a landscape architect to create a master plan for the library's grounds. Uh, we're seeking 20000 in CPA funds with an additional 5000 that has been promised by the Friends of Forbes Library. Uh, we are looking for a plan that will create a unified vision for our three-acre property, uh, focusing on rehabilitating the landscape and hardscape surrounding the library. Um, we're looking for uh, a plan that will, as it says, ins be inspiring, engaging, and resilient. And I'll talk a little bit about how we hope to achieve that. Uh, this turn-of-the-century photo shows the property as it stood about 100 years ago when the oaks are about the same size as the new oaks that we've planted, it's kind of fun. Um, so the project goals are to bring the natural elements of the property in unity with the historical building and increase access to passive recreation opportunities for the public. We want to preserve all that is functioning about the grounds while improving their appearance, functionality, and environmental integrity and climate resiliency. Uh, this is an aerial uh, view, courtesy of uh, some online site uh, that, that shows the property here. And I'll just point out a couple of things from this. So we are, as you probably know, on Route 66, there's a tree belt along the front. Um, it's kind of hard to see here, but there's some large mature trees on either side that, with a bunch of smaller trees. So we have had, unfortunately, see, be, begun to see the um, the end of a lot of the stately 100-year-old trees on the property coming to the end of their lifespan for, for various reasons. So we're starting to see this property change, and, and so the pl this plan is in part response to that. Uh, the large lawn to the right of the library building 
Um, the one close on the bottom of the image is what we call the West Lawn. And so we're really, that's the place that we've been holding a lot of our programming and, and um, a lot of our big gatherings there. And it works fine. We run, a, we run an extension cord across the lawn, um, set up a very primitive sort of plywood um, screen, uh, uh, staging rather. Uh, but it has the potential to really have the, the infrastructure there so that we can more easily and readily support outdoor programming. Um, the front of the building has um, uh, a lawn space that really is not thriving. You know, one of the pro parts of this project is could we do it, do it less long while not, of course, impacting the, the beauty of the building, but um, there's some lawn spaces that aren't thriving. They're not really used. Um, and the hardscape that was there is there around the front of the building, unfortunately, is not weathering well. It's cracking, and there's some existing conditions photos in, in there that just shows we've been working with the DPW to replace some stones and crack uh, repair some some cracks in our in our ramp. But the it's not weathering well. Um, um, let's see other things I want to point out. The property has historic value, and I hopefully I've highlighted some of that in the report. Um, one of the things I did, neglected to mention was the Mill River used to run around on the back of the property. Um, it is now a steep embankment that goes down to the bike path. Um, but there's, there's, this property is steeped in history, and I think this project is we could bring some of that to life. Um, our guiding principles um, are that the library is an active community hub, and increasingly the grounds have played an important role. This photo was taken out of the library um, through one of our windows and shows an outdoor concert on that Great West Lawn. Um, besides being used for programming, it is also used by individuals and community groups all the time when we are closed. Improvements to these grounds would be done in consultation with our community partners and with direct public feedback is something that we're very committed to. Um, we want to come out of this process with a cohesive plan, which is something that the grounds have never been looked at in this way. Uh, a plan that can be implemented in five years and will be viable for the next 50 years, resilient to climate change and proactive in terms of succession planting are some of the things that we're particularly interested in achieving. Uh, we seek a plan that will be informed by and in unity with the historic building and property and that can be accomplished in phases over the next five years. We want it to do low maintenance both in regard to human labor as well as with materials that are durable, long lasting and follow lead certification standards. Um, here's a picture of our recent planting of the pollinator garden bed outside of the children's department. It's a small bed that we're sort of experimenting with as a demonstration garden. Um, and this was planted in collaboration with the Western Mass Pollinators Network and our preschool story time group. Uh, this picture is not an image of Forbes Library, but is another public library that's using their property in sort of an interesting way for a story walk. And it's something we've been thinking of, even poems or a poetry book that you read in, out in nature. Um, I think that once we think about our grounds, there's all kinds of projects that can really tie into our mission as a public library um, and engage people to want to go out and spend time there. Um, we have some physical accessibility improvements that are needed, such as curb cuts, but we are also talking about accessibility in terms of a landscape that is approachable, inviting, and encourages discovery. Um, as Lily Lombard wrote in her letter of support, I agree with the characterization that Forbes is our community hub. Investment in Forbes, especially with a focus on accessibility, equity, and ecology, as this plan intends, is one of the best inve investments we can make in our community health. Um, so why are we coming to you now? Um, as was mentioned in our application, the garden space was the second most requested new endeavor uh, for our library in a community survey that over 1,000 residents took. Um, after adding a homework center, which you'll be happy to know, we are also working on adding a homework center. Um, the weather and the landscaping is changing and we need a plan. Uh, this photo shows the public shade tree belt with one of our new scarlet oaks um, that we planted in collaboration with Tree Northampton and the DPW. And behind it are a few of the property's remaining century old trees that are nearing the end of their life. Um, the lawn space, some of which might not be necessary, is tired, as are many of the existing plantings and hardscape features. The property needs a unifying plan to bring the elements together. 
Uh, the CPA, along with others, has invested heavily in the Forbes Library, and I hope that you'll agree that it has paid off in terms of what excellent shape the building is in, how gorgeous it is, and how engaged our community is in using it. Now is the time to think about the grounds and what we can do to bring them up to the same level of form and function as the building. Um, who will be positively impacted by this project? Lots of folks, I'll argue. Uh, we have just finished compiling last year's statistics and more than 50% of Northampton residents are active card holders. We had just over 220,000 visitors last year and nearly 20,000 came to attend a program. Uh, Forbes serves people of all ages and backgrounds and strives to make its collections and services meaningful, equitable, and relevant. Um, this project will build the infrastructure so that we can hold programs outside with more ease. We can entice more people to observe and engage with nature and we can be prepared for the next 50 years. So I'll leave you with this quote. Um, if you have a garden and a library, you have everything you need. Uh, <laughs> so we certainly have a beautiful library and we have <coughs> adequate grounds, but we really see their potential and hope you will too. Um, these two photos, again, not Forbes. The one on the left is one you know, sort of looking around to see. Um, this is a national movement. It's not something that we've been thinking of, but libraries in general, I think lots of public spaces are thinking about um, engaging people using the, all of the natural resources that they have. Um, and on the left is a sensory garden in Ohio that was built to be accessible. Um, it's also built um, to have aroma and um, textural elements so that it could be enjoyed by uh, a broad range of people. And on the right, more locally, is an image of the uh, gazebo that sits right outside the children's rooms, room doors of their new library building and um, they are using it quite heavily for programming. They're seating there, they have a beautiful view of the Connecticut River, but I think it really goes to show if you can build um, a, a structure that really just extends the library services outside the doors, and that's what we hope to do with this project. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I would edit that to say if you have a garden, in a library and twenty thousand dollars. Yes. <laughs> uh, questions? Yes. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Chris. Um, so after you've got your master plan, um, I see that there's a, a placeholder for a two hundred thousand mm dollar -hmm. investment. To um, how are you going to get there? So I think that some of the project would be uh, community block grant eligible. Um, I think some. I think that this might be a project that Smith College might be interested in making a gift for. I have, have not been approached and have no um, commitments, but it, we are their neighbor. They've undertaken a large um, land, landscape plan to see the value in a project of this nature. Um, we would definitely be doing some fundraising grant seeking and possibly coming back to this group for more funding. Thanks. Yeah. So I, I don't see a budget in the application package, so it's just a flat fee to this um, consultant mm -hmm. to do this. And you've got a couple of different bids from people that yeah, so I, we haven't gotten bids, so we would go through an RFP process, um, sort of working from this number. We are not a city department, but um, use have the same contracting regulations, so we would we would um, put out an RFP process, sort of the, uh, the way that was done for the windows that, that we just uh, that the CPC invested along with the city. Other questions? Where did you come up with two hundred fifty thousand dollars? That the number. So again, speaking with people, um, looking at other projects, um, sort of piecemealing. We have lots of ideas of specific things that we'd like this project to include. I mean, this the platform stage area. I think is one just because it, it's something that we hit up against over and over. And some of our curb cuts and sidewalk issues are really concrete. No pun intended. Uh, that's, but I think we have too many thoughts for the project, so we have um, a laundry list of things, and I think we wouldn't probably be able to achieve them all. Um, but looking at them and sort of the scope of the projects based on other work that we've looked at, it seems like a reasonable figure. Could you share that with us? Yes. 
Other questions? Thank you so much. All right. Uh, so if you have an agenda, we're switching things up a little bit. Correct, uh, sir. Next up is Habitat for Humanity. Is that where it goes? Uh Executive Director of Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity. Thanks for letting me come back again. Um, so uh, I, I know that I've done this introduction to you before, but I don't know who's standing behind me, and so I just figured I'd start at the beginning, which is that Pioneer Valley Habitat for Humanity works with many partners in the community to build strength, stability, and self-reliance through affordable home ownership in Hampshire and Franklin counties. We're an affiliate of Habitat for Humanity which is an international organization um, with a mission to find a decent place to live for everyone. Um, research has shown that home ownership leads to increases in graduation rates, children's good health, net family wealth, decreases in children's behavioral problems, reliance on government assistance, asthma, and another, a number of other uh, positive outcomes for the families that are able to break the cycle of poverty through the lasting impact of a home. Um, so we've been building homes in the Pioneer Valley for 30 years now, and um, we've built 43 homes in Hampshire and Franklin counties. Um, we do it with the community and with our future homeowners. They contribute hundreds of hours of volunteer work, as well as unpaid volunteers and contractors, um, we also pay some contractors, that's why we have construction budgets, but it's this combination of working with the community that makes our projects affordable. Our homeowners all must demonstrate that they're willing to partner with us in that by contributing their time in sweat equity. So I'm here today to talk about our project on Glendale Road here in Northampton. Um, this is a project that the city initiated with um, over 50 acres of conservation land and four building lots for affordable housing. Um, we have already come before you for funding for the three back lots on a, it's on a common driveway and those houses are under construction. Um, I'll get to that in a little bit, but tonight I'm here to request funds for lot one, which is highlighted, which is a frontage lot, not on the common driveway. The, Three houses on the back, or you can kind of see in that panoramic photo there, there's two are nearly complete. We have the certificate of occupancy and we hope to close um, maybe next week. Um, we're going through a few punch lists and a few legal items just to get that ready to sell to the homeowners. And then the third house, we're um, stick framing instead of using modular construction. So this was our experiment with modular construction and we found that it was difficult to find zero energy modular homes um, at an affordable price. Our initial quotes didn't come in as expected. So part of what we did there is we built the, we're building the third one to look like the modulars as kind of a control to our experiment and learning more about that process. So that one is well underway with a roof on and siding coming soon. Uh, but the lot that we would, we this is sort of phase two of this project because it's separate while it's uh, get a neighbor in common. It's not on the same driveway. It's on the right on Glendale Road. Um, we were able to move forward with this one more quickly than we thought. And we're really excited. Um, we've cleared the trees for the lot and actually have the footings for the foundation in already. So this would be ready to start framing in the spring. It's a simple ranch home, which fits in well with the neighborhood. Um, there's a number of small ranches here. That, so this being the more uh, front face to the neighborhood, it fits in just like the next door neighbor. It's um, gonna be a small home. It's under a thousand square feet, it's two bedrooms. Uh, we've been talking with PV Squared about doing solar panels on the south so that this might also be a zero net energy home. 
and uh, it will be accessible. So we have this house designed so that someone in a wheelchair could move in. Um, we often say adaptable because we won't do special counters or other features, but the basic floor plan of the house has been designed with those circles there in the bathrooms and the bedrooms indicating that a, the turning radius of a wheelchair, probably can't see it on the screen as well, but a wheelchair could fit into this house. It's all one story, um, so it's a great place for someone who needs to age in place or is currently has some mobility impairments. Um, we're now accepting applications for the house. And there's an information session this Saturday. Um, so please tell anyone you know. Um, we uh, have applications available at the Forbes Library, uh, as well as City Hall and at our office and on our website. So this is an exciting time for this project. Um, we're requesting $30,000 from the committee um, to, which I think would be a deep investment for showing the city's ongoing commitment to this project. Um, the overall cost is estimated to be less than some of, than the previous project where we were doing the <coughs> three bedroom, two story modular construction. This is a little bit of a simpler building. Uh, but still one with great energy efficiency and an opportunity for someone to have a place to call home here in Northampton. Uh, the funds that would be invested would be protected through a deed restriction that would make the home permanently affordable into the future so that when our home, first homeowner who puts in the sweat equity goes to sell the house, their maximum resale price would be capped so that it could be affordable to a, another family in the future. So that is sort of an overview and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. Questions? I'm trying to remember you were looking at a different financing model at one point with your mortgages. Could, could you refresh me on that and tell me sure. where you're at on that? So for the three houses on the common driveway, we are partnering with um, Greenfield Cooperative Bank slash Northampton Cooperative Bank, they merged, and East Hampton Savings Bank. So Habitat for Humanity has traditionally done a zero interest mortgage directly from our affiliate. So we're raising funds and providing the mortgage to our homeowners. Uh, the problem with that, we get paid back over 20 or 30 years, That's you know, good long-term income, but it doesn't, the cost of construction increases much more rapidly than the payback of that mortgage. So for the three houses on the Common Drive, we have partnered with the local bank to offer a first mortgage to the homeowners at a slightly below market rate, interest rate, and then we're providing a soft second mortgage. So the mortgage that we're providing essentially makes the monthly payments equivalent to a zero interest, even though those homeowners are paying interest on their first mortgage. Um, our second mortgage, they don't have to make payments on, but if they have to go sell the house, then they pay it back to us. Um, and if they live in the house for 20 years, they don't have to pay us back. Um, so it's uh, forgiven 5% every year. So if they move out after 10 years, then they pay us back half of that loan. But that's really what allows us to offer home ownership to people below 60% of the area median income. Most home ownership programs target 80% or 100% of the area median income. So we're looking at a demographic a little with tighter budgets. Um, and uh, we, you know, that sort of also helps us with construction costs, which is one of the reasons we're trying these different financing strategies, because when we sell the house, we, the first mortgage will come to us, but we're still investing a lot of community resources with our second mortgage and investments in energy efficiency. Where are you going to go? Because I, I want to follow up. Uh, just real quick, um, how do you, how typically how long do homeowners stay in one of the properties? Do they, is that I, an average? I I don't have a statistic, but most you know in the time I've been with Habitat now for the, this affiliate for 
um, about six years, and there have been uh, two resales out of the 43. So um, it's not a frequent occurrence. Most people, um, it's more affordable than renting in the community. Um, you know, so we had one uh, family that decided to sell their house because they were doing well and they wanted to move closer to their employment. You know, so that was kind of a graduation uh, story in some ways. We, you know, um, we have had the, you know, the things that happened to, in society at large, you know, divorce and, you know, things that change family dynamics that like, make people move. Chris? Just, does anybody else have a question about this project? Because I want to talk about the financing thing, which is not really so I have another question, but you can do this. No, go ahead. I don't want to spend a hard time on that. Um, I just wondered with the modular, which, you know, with, with, the, with two of the homes, whether there's a trade-off there because you're not engaging as many volunteers, and whether you saw any impact from that and your fundraising yeah. um, and how you're how you're viewing that, if it was a feasible model. So the um, fundraising actually, I think, went better because people were excited about us trying something new. Uh -huh. um, so we are we had a number of grants that were a good fit. Um, we uh, had the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources um, uh, gave us $50,000 per house um, as part of a grant through the state of Vermont to bring zero energy modular homes to Massachusetts. Um, so this was the time to try it uh, because of that extra grant support. Um, I, I think we did find that uh, we had, the company that we worked with typically delivers the home completely finished all the appliances like pretty much ready to move in is their standard model but we asked them to give us a price that was a little bit lower but with um without the finishes so that our in the sidings or volunteers could do those tasks um i think we've uh underestimated the amount of time those tasks would take so we had plenty to do um so we didn't see a, a decrease need for volunteers I do think we still finish the houses more quickly um, than if we had built them from the ground up. So we did two houses in a year that would have probably taken one house that same amount of time, but it wasn't the half the time of the, that we had thought it might be. And some of that was just general contracting delays too with site work and things like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Right. A few more minutes. Okay. Um, so I was curious about uh, the, 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 the double mortgage model. Is that yeah. this is the first time you have tried this? So the, the very first time was also in Northampton over on Garfield Avenue. Um, so we're, we're on our second time trying it um, here, but both of these uh, pilots were here in Northampton where there's really high home values and so I, it's an area that I think people are really open to getting creative. Um, I think it's something that will give us greater capacity in the long run um, because when you have to raise every dollar for the project through grants and community you know, donations, um, it's, uh, it's more work versus some of that budget is a mortgage getting paid to us of our total development budget for the project. Are other people trying it as well? I mean, are other ha habitats? Sort of? Yeah, I think we're um, probably, the, the concept, yes, and then the finer details yeah. probably vary between affiliates. So we're all, there's uh, over a dozen habitat affiliates in Massachusetts, and we all are independent nonprofits. Um, but we get together every other month, the executive directors, and share information and ideas. So things like this zero equivalent mortgage is something that we're talking about. The other mortgage strategy that we've used in other communities is partnering with um, the USDA has a subsidized interest mortgage. So in the more rural communities here, that's been another way we've been able to keep the affordability at the level we want, but um, use different financing. Thanks. How many applicants do you get for each house on average? Um, it, so I think there's, so we have, on our notification list, 
we have something like 500 people who have contacted us at one point or another and said we're interested. And then people who show up to information sessions is much, you know, sometimes it's 10 people, sometimes it's 20, you know, it varies. Um, I think it's harder, it's getting harder. Like when I first started at Habitat, we had an info session with 50 people at it. It's getting harder to get people to show up in person to things. I think people expect information online and uh, there's a little culture shift there. But then the number of actual complete applications is smaller and then the number of eligible applications is even smaller. So sometimes it's a dozen applications, but the application takes a lot of work. It's your tax returns for the last three years, pay subs, uh, proof of your rent, um, other assets and debt, you know, if you're divorced, a copy of your divorce decree, your child support payments, uh, it's a lot of paperwork. So, um, like it is when you apply, go to the bank and apply for a mortgage, um, we're asking for that same level of documentation. And that's a, a barrier we haven't found a way around other than providing um, as much. Uh, hand-holding as we can, answering questions. Um, Valley CDC has been very helpful. Uh, Donna Cabana, who works there doing home ownership counseling, often refers people or people who go to the first-time home buyer classes. Um, we have also sent people to her if they're, they don't know how to get those documents, and sometimes she can sit down and do budget counseling and those sorts of things that make them more ready to apply. One last question. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, next up is uh, Wayne with Office of Planning and Sustainability on the Invasive Species Pilot, i.e., the goats. Thanks. <laughs> We're so, very excited that you're going to bring in a goat, but. It was raining. We didn't like the rain. Uh, <laughs> um, so, and you may have questions of the goats that I'm not really going to answer. This is, this is a pilot study, so we don't really quite know what we're doing. So, just sort of quick background. We, my office manages five different um, agricultural fields that are part of conservation. Um, we've slowly been moving into organic when we can. We haven't always been able to do that. Uh, and then we manage about 18% of the city, 20% of the city as conservation land and have to deal with invasive plants there. Um, and with climate change and just with time, the one area where I think we're losing ground in conservation is invasive plants. We're having more and more challenges in invasive plants. So on the one hand, we're having more challenges in invasive plants. On the other hand, I think there's a strong interest in the community for using as little chemicals as possible. Um, the city now has a pesticide reduction committee that's looking for, for opportunities. We've been approaching this as um, sort of value-free. We're not saying that we ever want to get rid of pesticides and herbicides if they have a role, but we want to minimize them whenever possible. So we've been looking at every part of our operation and saying, can we do mechanical treatment? Can we do, in this case, goats? Can we reduce the amount of chemicals that, that are being used on our properties? Um, we had a woman, we've been looking at goats for a while. When goat girls came to Amherst, we sort of negotiated to get that, could we get them to come to a couple of sites? And the prices were too high, and frankly, their rules didn't work for us. They were very concerned about people harassing the goats, and so lots of places that we had the greatest need, they weren't willing to work there. And in spite of the fact their prices were fairly high, their model ultimately failed. Um, we had a woman who approached us this summer who said, you know, I want to explore this. It's going to be a labor of love. I'm not looking at a great return. And she offered to do a free pilot for us. Um, and so we've been sort of thinking about what's the role of goats in the overall mix. We know it's much less efficient um, and therefore more expensive than using chemicals, but we think it may have a really good role in some places. So the pilot study we did was by Veterans Field and Bike Path, which is a place where uh, Japanese knotweed was literally grown over the bike path. But if we didn't physically cut it back, a 10 foot bike path could literally be only four feet wide before it got cut down again. Um, and then cutting it has a the potential actually expanding it because you have all this vegetative material. So that was our pilot study. It was an area next to the city switched all of our recreation fields that are now being managed organically. 
So it's next to an organic area, it's next to a, uh, um, a vernal pool, which is a rare habitat type, um, very visible on the bike path. So we thought that would be a great pilot study. That was the first one, it didn't cost us anything other than this woman working really hard. We then hired her for a second pilot study. Um, again, $500 for two weeks worth of work. She was probably earning a dollar an hour by the time it was done. Um, and that was off Lindsey Road. We have some conservation area that uh, Broadbrook showed like Greenway, which abuts against the farm. We're working with Pioneer Valley Worker Center to create this organic farm uh, for uh, new Americans. Um, and there's an area that's far too overgrown for them to farm it. Um, we take a lot of chemicals to treat it, and that might jeopardize their goal of being organic, so we've been testing it there. So the idea is to scale up, and so we're going to be experimenting. Um, we know the sort of sites we want to look at, but we're going to keep, each time we do a site, we're going to come back and study it and do it. We would like to use the same woman, because frankly, the commercial model is still too expensive. You know, So she's sort of subsidizing this model with, with her time, so that's why it works. So I'll give you an example of sort of sites we we'll look at, but again, we haven't determined any site, but you've also partners. So you all know, I think I've got half our got, there was going to be a proposal for CPA for um, chemical treatment by the Birch Strip Road Community Gardens. Mm -hmm. um, big outcry from both Village Hill residents and Community Gardens residents. So that's one potential site. It may or may not work. There's lots of things we have to look at. We don't, we don't want to do this as a feel-good thing. We want this as an honest study of where do goats work and where do they not work. I want to be really careful not setting up a site that's due for failure. So, we, so we're trying to figure out. But that's the sort of site we want to look at. Um, the Grove Food North Hampton managed a lot of property up of uh, uh, Meadow Street. Grove Food North Hampton is organic, but they're not purists. So we own the entire edge. We own three quarters of a mile of the river frontage that's all wooded. And there's no question Japanese not weeds and other things are marching from our property into Grove Food North Hampton property. They're willing for us to treat our property chemically if that's what it takes. We might, but we would prefer not to. And so that's a potential pilot site. Again, there's other sites around. Those two are high in our list of possible sites. We'd be looking at all of our portfolio and all the recreation department's portfolio and saying, where do we think this can go to be most effective in the process? And just to disclose, we know this could not work, you know, and, and if we find it's just not working, we're called off midway through the summer. Um, but we, I want, I want to, you know, the nature of a pilot is we just don't know how well this is going to work. Questions? When you did the pilot on Veterans Field, is the area fenced? She fenced the goats. Okay, so, so she would fence. do this in this situation as well. Yes. Okay. One thing that's made it wonderful to work with her, but frankly has made the pilot a little less effective, is she's a writer, so she hangs out with the computer while the goats wander, and then when she wants to get up and stretch, she pulls some of the weeds that Japanese not weed herself. But it means it's hard to always tell what do the goats do versus what did she do. Maybe that's fine. Maybe we would always do a hybrid, but... Uh, how do you, in my experience, walking around different parts of the city in the land, the Japanese knotweed is sometimes in these big areas, but many, many times it's sort of a comp here, you walk out, and then it's a comp. I mean, how would you, I mean, say it worked great in this area, like how would you envision even do, implementing something like that when it's so diffuse? Well, certainly, that's, I mean, there are probably two priority areas, two classes of priority areas. One is when there's a reason for particular chemical sensitivity. So next to organic field, next to where kids play, next to a body of water. Those are the places we'd like to use chemicals the least. Um, and, but then in terms of effectiveness, places where it's 100% invasives are easiest. So in theory, you can do mini fencing in smaller areas, but the area off by Veterans Field is 100% of the area within the thousands of big trees was Japanese knotweed, the area which off Lindsay Road is sort of similar. So at, at least for our pilot study, we're going to do it in places where we want everything down. It's hard to assign like a half a goat FTE. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is it just knotweed? 
<clears throat> no, it could be other things. You're going to quickly get beyond my expertise. So that's where we're trying to figure out what's the, you know, where do they work best. So poison ivy, for example, they work really great. But this particular woman, her goats are almost pets. So she doesn't want poison ivy because poison ivy are great for goats that you leave outdoors all the time but maybe not for goats, which you're personally handling. Um, so there are other things, but I, again, I'm not the one to tell you in detail. <clears throat> so when I, I think the, the procedures for eradicating uh, Korean knotweed, Japanese knotweed, is still kind of evolving in many ways. Um, these goats, from what I understand, they, they eat the, the plant, the stalk, but they don't go down to the root or the, the uh, rhizomes that go across the land. Um, so ten thousand dollars is a lot of money. A quick calculation says I could get a crew of three or four people for about two and a half weeks to work with size or and cut down that same amount of knotweed, or probably much more knotweed than a goat could do. So I wonder how do you balance that? What is the, so the benefit of goats over yeah. human power? Uh, so the theory is at least you're doing dense enough that their hooves itself are causing some damage to the structure. You're not going deep down, but you're getting some. That's the reason, but that's the reason why the community gardens and Birdsport Road might not work, because it's very deeply rooted. Um, we're looking at that as well. So we're separately, we are trying to treat it mechanically. Um, so I think we're trying to look at all the different methods and understand it. There are people who swear by goats and say how great, I mean, you clearly have to do more than one treatment. There's no question the plants are gonna come back no matter what we do out there. But I think we're trying to answer that for us is what you know what makes sense for it. Other questions? How long do you think ten thousand dollars is going to last? Twenty weeks. How, about, how long? Twenty weeks. Twenty weeks. Yeah. On um, all of your proposed sites. Yeah. So we, assuming we just use one person, we're basically doing five hundred dollars for a treatment. Um, I mean, it may not be continuous, but that's sort of the idea. Look at, if let's, let's look at 20 applications. And what would the what would the price have been if, for the same thing with the private supply? Well, if we get herbicide, probably about two thousand dollars the same. Entry. No, I mean that the other uh, the goat girl service. Oh, if you were going um, to do that for the same. Yeah, they, they don't exist anymore. It was about twice the cost. Twice the doing. Yeah. Yeah, I was familiar with that. The they were great. I didn't yeah. know that they went under them. Yeah, they gave the goats actually to Smith Oak, and then we approached Smith Oak to say, could we use any goats with a similar thing? Yes, you have a big field we could fence in, but not the sort of sites that we're looking at. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Great. Okay, thank you, Wayne. Okay. And uh, we'll keep you up for okay. the uh, Rocky Hill Greenway. Okay. Tom, you want to keep trying to get? So let me just walk through this quickly. I'm going to ask Tom from Mass Audubon to give you more details about the site. So um, this is the, the Pine Grove Golf Course. Um, golf Course was developed starting about 50 years ago. Um, a labor of love. The same operator has been there the entire time. He's now in his mid the late 70s and, and ready to retire. Um, the sort of work he did was totally state of the art when he began 50 years ago, but the world has changed. Um, and he was filling wetlands and draining buffer zones. And again, totally both did a really nice job as a golf course, but not something we want now. Um, we're interested in the site for maybe six reasons I'm going to go through quickly, and Tom can give you a little more detail. So, um, we're interested in, you know, we've been building this Rocky Hill Greenway, some of it with PAC CPA funding, some with other funding. Um, it tells an important story, that whole area between uh, Route 10, well, between Mass Audubon and Route 5, and then building west from that. Um, it's been, you know, a nice continuous area. This is the next logical place for both human enjoyment and for animal habitat. So, two, re you know, two traditional conservation reasons, human enjoyment and animal and plant habitat. Um, and we're interested in restoring it and sort of generally, you know, how do we restore natural systems? It's been part of the city's goals well before climate change. And so when we can get natural systems restored, that's absolutely wonderful, I'm getting wildlife moved. This area is particularly important as we think about a wildlife corridor from the meadows to the upland areas. 
This is, you know, in theory protected a corridor up to the state hospital, but it's a pretty narrow corridor, so this is an important piece. And usually when we're buying land, we're talking about protecting an existing corridor. In this case, when S is trying to restore a corridor that's mostly not there um, and, and bring it back. I mean, it's great for turkeys and deer right now, but it's not great for sort of what, what it used to be there. So that's sort of the normal rates of restoration. But then in a climate change piece, we're particularly interested when we think about climate resilience. So we have a program now which we've gotten about $400,000 in state grants for so far, we're about to get a $350,000 federal grant, which we call New Hampton Designs with Nature, of how do we restore natural systems to catch floodwaters. We, as part of the Valley CBC Lumberyard Project, we spent um, almost $2 million uh, fixing up 600 feet of stormwater. That's not a long-term sustainable strategy. Even if there's no climate change, we couldn't afford to replace all of our 100 plus year pipes. And then obviously with climate change, we have to replace pipes even before they collapse to make them bigger. So that's not, we can't do that. And so the Kingdom Lines of Nature is how we catch water before it enters city pipes, before it enters floodplains, and store it. So a golf course is a perfect opportunity. The, the grass itself, water hits the grass and runs off very quickly. And even if it didn't, that entire property is underlain with, with drains. So even if the water doesn't run off the surface, it goes into the ground and hits these uh, drainage tiles and runs off. And so it causes lots of erosion on the site, potential risks to Route 10, potential risks to Mass Autobahn property, which is downstream, which is one of the reasons they're on. So from a climate resiliency standpoint, it's important. The Secretary of Energy and Environmental Affairs singled out this project when they gave this year's land. It, so in case you haven't heard, we got the $400,000 state grant, which we said we were applying for in the application. But when we got the grant, the Secretary said specifically, she likes this project a lot because of its climate restoration business. She came from the municipal vulnerability program side of things. Um, and then the regeneration side. You may know the city has a goal of being carbon neutral by 2050. There is no way we are going to end using all fossil fuels by 2050. So the only way we can be carbon neutral, net carbon neutral, is by some combination of reducing our fossil fuel footprint and by offsets. So, you know, people driving to Northampton are still going to own gasoline powered cars. We have no control over that. There's lots of things we have no control over. And so we want to be sequestering enough carbon to balance that out. Um, and so we're going to go through the process of how much carbon we're creating, what would the value of this carbon be if we sold it on the Chicago Carbon Exchange, which we're not going to sell. But because if we sell, we don't get credit for ourselves. But we want to go through that exercise of what's the value for it. And so this becomes, along with lots of other properties in town, part of our strategy for, for making this carbon neutrality goal. So I'm not the scientist, so Tom from Mass Audubon knows everything about the property. So, why is the property important? Good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Tom Watsonheiser, Mass Audubon's regional scientist with my office uh, at Media. Um, for many years, and thanks, Wayne. For many years, uh, I've explored Arcadia and been amazed at how unstable uh, a small brook is on the property called Nashawanic Brook, which experiences every time it rains these tremendous uh, flashy uh, flows where the water just comes right up and there's all these uh, oxbows and uh, meanders that, that break off like far more frequently than any little stream really should be doing. So I, I've been curious about why this stream has been unstable and it finally dawned on me when I went to the golf course upstream on Nashawanic Brook that there's a hundred acres of basically, you know, water just pouring into this little stream that's the central central thread of this golf course. Water just pours in there and it comes right down the system and blasts onto the 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 lowland um, at Arcadia before the brook gets down to the Mayhan River. So to me, when I heard that the golf course was up for sale. It's like, wow, we have an opportunity here to do really one of the clearest climate change adaptation restoration projects as, as I, I'm familiar with anywhere. It's at a small scale, but this kind of reforestation 
um, protecting the buffer zone, restoring uh, riparian functions, I'm sure is going to slow that water down and, uh, you know, contribute to improving the quality of the water and the quantity of the water uh, through that watershed below, below the golf course. So I'm particularly excited about, about that opportunity. Um, I've been involved in several restoration, wetland restoration, riparian restoration projects, but this one is like really, the golf course is like a great sandbox. It gives us a lot to work with, and I think the pieces are there for a really fantastic restoration. So um, protecting that, that property or conserving that property is the first step. And so I'm, I'm excited um, for this you know, for this application. I hope the uh, committee is uh, favorable toward it. So just quickly in terms of funding we, where we are, so we've received this $400,000 state grant, um, which covers at 64% of the, well, a little bit less than 64 purchase price because the, because the, the value of the property. We're obviously asking you for help to, to complete the purchase price for, for the property. Mass Audubon is contributing two things to the partnership. One is, you know, for Community Preservation Act, we're required to put conservation restrictions on properties, and that is a value or cost to us, usually about $15,000 if Mass Audubon is, is absorbing for that piece. And then they're also going to be a major partner in terms of finding out a grant money to restore the property that's out here. Um, in addition, we are getting some uh, tree mitigation money from Consolidated Edison um, Solar Voltaic Field, which is being developed on First Pit Road. Um, and so we're planning to use a substantial amount of that money to reforest the site, so it could now be tree plantings. We're going to be applying for another municipal vulnerability grant. Um, I don't know if we may or may not get to do a master plan and do some low hanging fruit. And so we're also asking money from you for additional funding for two categories. One is to help us match that state grant if we get it, and then for some quick money for things which we want to do do very quickly, you know, remove the pump house that was right by the dam and they pumped water up um, where there's any place to worry about has some material up there because they have diesel fuel there. Um, put a hole in the dam or think about how to put a hole in the dam to, so it, it's not holding back water and we don't want it to hold back water. We might even do things because of these series of cash basins around the property, we might even put little berms around the cash basins so that we see are holding more water in the property. So a series of small projects overall. That's my thing. Thank you. Uh, question? So if, it, if there's some chance of partial funding, would this would the restoration be something that could be delayed or parsed out into smaller pieces or how would you so the big rest the restoration is going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars over but this is just the decades. first phase right? right so this phase we could we would we were worried about a few things one is you know invasives get more expensive to treat as they start marching in so there's costs there some things like getting rid of the all the facilities that had diesel fuel in it getting rid of structures that are within where the wetlands were before they were filled um, We'd rather we we'd like not to wait because it gets more expensive and creates more damage. So we so this is still sort of a down payment on a longer, sure. much bigger project. Um, Do you foresee coming back to CPC for funding for those projects? <coughs> You're obviously not committed to anything. We're going to be looking everywhere that we can. Mass Audubon knows funding sources that we don't know. The Municipal Vulnerability Program has a 25% local match, but that includes staff, and that includes Mass Audubon's donated time. So. Maybe we'd certainly not going to be, except for this sort of low hanging fruit, it's actually never going to be 100% city. If there was a grant and a 10% match made a difference, we might well apply with no commitment from you whatsoever. Do you have any sense of the order of magnitude of what a full, quote unquote, full restoration? You know, I don't even know what that looks like, but well, I'm sure you could pour money into it forever. I'll ask Tom, right? That, that's one of the key decisions. So we, I mean, we know that where wetlands were filled, we'd like to restore that. Yeah. We know that where drainage was added, we'd like to at least close the drainage. We are never going to move all the soil that was moved over 50 years. And so that's the other thing. We, besides the cost, I don't know the answer. We haven't done the strategic thinking of what do we do. So for example, it's tree planting. One of the things we have to work with Mass Audubon is we're going to plant the trees in the spring or fall, but actually not the, in the best, most important areas. So the wetlands that we restore, we're not going to plant trees that we then dig up. 
we're going to look at what are the places high in the land that we know we're not going to mess with and plant trees there. So we don't really know the number. I mean, if I can make some environmental number, assessment get you sort of some all the way down the road towards that sort yeah. of master plan? Right, right. And, and so we always think about, like, Dan Willow's example. So, so Sarah and her hat in my office is looking at to do a full dam removal, which might involve dredging the pond. Mm -hmm. um, it's very expensive, and the permits itself are a nightmare. But to breach the dam, to let water out, which is lower the water level is incredibly easy, to take the dam outlet structure, and literally it's a granite, I mean a concrete structure, literally drill a hole so usually water's down when the big rainstorm that comes up, that's very expensive and the permit is easy. So we're trying to look at those, what are the quick things that make a huge difference. <coughs> And is the grant contingent on some level of funding, land grant? It's contingent. Is it contingent on some level of local funding? Yes, it's contingent. So the grant is paying roughly six percent of purchase price. Mm -hmm. So we need to get that other forty percent. The two fifty. Okay. Right. Exactly. Is there any additional uh, funding available at this point for the restoration? So I'm looking at the budget, and I see nothing. So yeah. So I didn't put that in here. So the the full um, funding that we're getting from Consolidated Edison is roughly $300,000. This is our first, so the extent that we can affect, so we may not use that at all, but to the extent we can effectively plant trees, we're taking that from the Consolidated Edison funding. The MVP, the Municipal Vulnerability Program, we're applying for $300,000 some odd thousand dollars for planning and for light steps. That one's not guaranteed, and we'll probably try to use the kind of money as a match for that. So those are sort of the most definite in the process. Um, uh, and then there's, there are other funding sources out there that we will be going after. And Tom may have a better sense than I do of what grants are, are available. But the Bird's Pit thing is a done deal. 300000 is coming in. That's and right. it is earmarked specifically for this project? It's earmarked for trees. And so we're going to be working with DPW on, so we, I don't know, we do, Tree, uh, you know, street trees. We want big street trees that make a presence, so they're there immediately. When we're restoring a site, they don't necessarily have to be as big, so money can go a lot further if you're just planting little six. So it's available for as much as makes sense. But again, we have to figure, we have to work with Mass Auto and say, what are the places we're ready for trees today? And what would the cost that be? So it could be substantially less if it's not needed, but we sort of get first crack at this, if you will. And it's just trees. It's just trees. Joy, your, your budget here has uh, $20,000 for conservation restriction and stewardship. Can you kind of explain that? So the nor when we work with most nonprofits, we're funding their staff time and their legal time for putting, putting together conservation restriction. And we're making a contribution to their stewardship where they then are putting money in whatever their endowment fund is, where each one's different. It basically says, hey, they're making a lifelong commitment, a permanent commitment to monitor this. They want to have money aside. It requires part of the land trust certification process, they do accreditation process. They're required to have money for both defending, you know, if they have to sue us, and their staff. So they have to put that aside. We value that at about $15,000. I don't know how Mass Audubon does it, whether it's higher or lower, but that's typically when we're paying cash for land trust for that city that we're paying. Um, then we have our own stewardship requirement. We will put $5,000 aside in Community Foundation of Western Massachusetts for exactly the same reason. We see, see sustainability as being important in everything, including funding. So $5,000 is our own stewardship. $15,000 is what we're valuing Mass Audubon's contribution. Thank you so much. Oh, wait, 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 so I want to go back to uh, the, the 150,000. Um, under the original proposal, it was sort of two-tiered. Um, the 250 was for the balance of the acquisition, and the 150 was for to get to get started on the yeah. And um, but it, the language said, but if we don't get the 400,000, fortunately we did. Um, we're going to come to you for that, and the number we'll be looking at is 650, which is the entire acquisition cost, and the 150 dropped off. Had that happened, what were you planning on doing to sort of kickstart the, the restoration? We would just be looking for grants and future funding, knowing some of this will rise. So I mean, the, you know, the reality is we lose the state grant if we don't get the 250 match. 
if we don't do the restoration, I mean, he's been in 50 years. We don't have to do the restoration this year, but we think, I mean, with exception of getting rid of the do diesel, that we have to do. Mm -hmm. But everything else we don't have to do, but we just think it's less expensive to do now than later. But there's no legal mandate for it. All right, thanks, fine. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Okay, and last but certainly not least, the North Commons project. Thank you for being patient and listening attentively to everybody else and laughing appropriately at the go. I was hiding. <laughs> While we're waiting, um, this has been kind of quick, Brian. Can we get another bite to ask some questions of the applicant that we think of again? We can always get those questions to Sarah, who can, uh -huh. uh, if things come up, is that correct, Sarah? Sure. And uh, yeah. get back to it. It's not like I'm closing the public hearing or anything to limit it up. No. no. Oops. All set? All set. Hi, I'm Julia Scannell. I'm with the Community Builders and my colleague, Krishna Farley, who you've seen before from the Community Builders. and. Our colleagues, Laura Baker and Joan Campbell from Valley uh, Community Development, who are our partners on the North Commons deal, which I know um, everyone here has seen before. So we can get going on it. I want to uh, let you know a little bit of background on the deal and also highlight what's changed since last time the project was presented to this committee. So we all know the beautiful Village Hill campus, um, North Commons is a 53-unit building that's going to be located on the very north part of the site. It's the largest uh, remaining undeveloped parcel on this part of the campus. And we're community builders and Valley Community Development is really excited to bring this affordable housing opportunity to the campus. Uh, going back to the community builders experience here, we already own and operate um, Hillside Place and Hilltop Apartments, which is 73 units of, excuse me, of affordable housing located on the campus. And we're also um, days away from breaking ground on uh, 35 Hill Till Road, which is a 12 unit uh, affordable housing building, also located on the front part of the site that the committee here uh, uh, generously awarded funds to in the last two rounds. Uh, this is some photographs of our existing hilltop and hillside properties on site. Um, here is a little background. So 35 is the smaller 12 unit building that's about to be constructed. And then North Commons is a larger 53 unit mixed income passive house building. Uh, it's going to be going in for 9% tax credits in DHCD's mini round for rental housing. We'll talk more about that a little later in the presentation. Um, it has, it preserves that, that, that large spot at the back of the campus, if everyone remembers, was originally slated to be more single family home development. So uh, having the one large building preserves a lot of open space. The plan has a shared community lawn and playground for the whole Village Hill campus. And, um, we were invited into the 2019 mini round, which is exclusively available for projects that submitted in the winter round, which is the traditional live tech round that are, uh, have a high level of readiness to proceed. And so the focus on this mini round is green building, which we're really excited about because we have a beautiful passive house design here. Uh, here, some more stats on it and an elevation showing that L shape of the building which will fit nicely on the back side of the lot. Uh, it will look like a smaller building uh, from, the sh from the street fitting in with the community. Here we go. It's uh, designed to follow the craftsman style of a lot of the single family homes up on site and we've gone through lots of design review with both Mass Development and the community up there. 
uh, we wanted to highlight uh, not just the building but the, the grounds. Uh, we are planning this large open green lawn where the North Commons name comes from uh, in between the building and the rest of the existing site. That will be a amenity for the whole campus. There's going to be a new playground there that is actually a very wide uh, range of ages. We're going to have uh, children's play equipment but also uh, some more uh, fitness themed equipment for uh, our adult population. And then we're also going to be building new walking trails that connect to the existing trails on the campus and in the city of Northampton. Uh, the role here is the community builders, it's a developer, owner, sponsor, will be managing the property and also offering resident services there to our residents. And then Valley Community Development is our co-sponsor and community liaison. Unit mix, 53 units, 12% of those are set aside for people at 30% of AMI, it's 23% of the units. Four of those units are gonna be designated for uh, clients of the uh, community-based housing program, which serves uh, disabled populations, and eight of those units are set aside for people from the facilities consul uh, sorry, consolidation fund, uh, which supports clients of the Department of Mental Health, which we feel is really meaningful and important in the history of the site. Uh, I'm sure as you're all aware, when the, the redevelopment of the site was proposed, there was supposed to be 15% set aside for uh, the clients of the Department of Mental Health. Uh, as the site has gotten built out, it's been predominantly um, market rate single family homes. So that, uh, that keeping within that um, set aside has really fallen to the uh, rental developers on site. It has really uh, been predominantly the community builders. So we're really, uh, it's part of our mission and we're really, we're really looking forward to bringing that back to the site to try to get closer to that quota. We'll have 27 units uh, that are straight low, uh, LIHTC, low-income housing tax credit units that are at 60% of AMI. Then we'll have 14 units which are funded through the Mass Housing Workforce Program. And those are income restricted up to 120%. So those will be our more market rate units. So it'll be a true mixed income project. This is our development budget for the whole. We are asking for $250,000 of CPA funds, so at 1.2% of our total budget. However, it's, it's much needed money. Um, without it, we have a gap. So uh, we are really, uh, we have lot, lot, lots of great commitment from the city of Northampton already, and we're looking forward to continuing that. We also have submitted funding for a uh, MassWorks grant along with the city of Northampton that we should hear back shortly on, and that is $950,000. And that is for uh, road and infrastructure work at Village Hill, uh, as well as some updates and connection and connections, connections, excuse me, to the existing trails. So here's uh, the, I wanted to show our timeline of the project to see what's changed. Um, in June 2017, we only had oops, excuse me, sorry about that. We only had our schematic design uh, last year in 2018 when when we came before you for funding last. We only had our design development uh, drawings. Now, in October 2019, we have 90% construction drawings and our passive house is modeled. So our, our, our numbers are getting more, uh, you know, pretty <laughs> close to the finals they can get until we go to bed. Uh, and so uh, that's why we've come back asking for more funds. Our uh, design group here is listed below as well. Um, if we are awarded, uh, in the mini round, which uh, we hope to be. Uh, we, I heard about 12 projects are invited into a round and eight are funded, which is uh, a much higher percentage than if you're just uh, in the typical round. Uh, we hope to hear in February of 2020. We hope to then close that following fall and start, con uh, start construction right away and then finish a year from then in 2021. Uh, I don't want to bore you with all of your criteria. You know this very well. But we do meet all the 11 criteria of uh, the general CPC. Um, more specifically, we meet the community housing and the open space criteria. We meet 10 of the 14 community housing program evaluation criteria. Again, I'm not going to bore you reading all these. Uh, we meet the city of Northampton's housing needs assessment uh, for rental housing for families and promoting a variety of housing for different uh, income levels. Uh, as to open space, 
we, we, we meet many of the project eligibility criteria for open space. And we meet eight of the 18 open space needs identified by the Conservation Commission and Planning Board. Benefits of North Commons, it is the second of two phases of mixed income units on site. We already spoke about our previous uh, building with those 12 units. It's dense design, flexible zoning, and it complements the nearby buildings. We balance the mixed income goals of the city of Northampton uh, with the introduction of the workforce housing tier, which we don't think has been used in Northampton yet, um, except for it will be implemented in our 35 village shelter road project, the 12 unit building. Uh, the playgrounds and significant open spaces, which is something that uh, the Village Hall campus doesn't have yet, and yeah, we've been attending the community meetings they have up there, and it's something we hear loud and clear from the community that they're looking for, and we're happy to provide that not only for our own residents, but for the whole community. Uh, we have strong municipal support and high community engagement from, from the owners up there. We really enjoy working in that neighborhood, and also we're passive house design. <coughs> Uh, to build responsibility and exceed green standards, especially the high standards set by the city of Northampton. So we're really excited about that, and especially to bring that level of green building to multifamily housing. Our readiness to proceed, we have advanced design drawings, 90% CDs, and we've received an estimate from the general contractor. Uh, we've been invited to this mini round. Uh, we meet the Commonwealth's growing focus on green and sustainable projects. Uh, we meet multiple CPC per few criteria, which we've begun over. And if we're funded in this uh, CPA round, uh, we can close and start construction within four to six months. And I'm sorry, that, that's a, of the funding of the uh, DHT award. And that's what we have. Do you have any questions tonight? Would you go back a couple of screens sure. to that open space? Yeah, right here, the open space needs. Um, it's just I know these are our things, but I wonder how when you put in a 53-unit building, we're protecting vistas and new sense, and we're protecting forest land. Sure. So uh, I, I can speak to those both individually. So protecting forest lands, uh, the whole lot that we're going to be acquiring is 43 acres. If we were not developing one single 53-unit building on that land, it would have been uh, subdivided into single family homes because the developed space is now about four acres. We are then allocating the rest of the land to con con sorry, <laughs> conservation land. So that's protecting the wooded area there up at the site. And then vistas, we have put a lot of thought into the location and placement of the building on the lot. I don't know if, if you're familiar with the back lot there, there is already a large open space. The building is going to be tucked right back into that tree line that's existing on site. And so uh, there's a slight slope down in the grade there already. So it, it, you'll see it. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a three, two and a half, three story building. You're definitely going to see it, but it's going to fit really nicely in there. It won't tower over anything. We've done a lot of studies on this because we do, we do want to take into account that. Um, the other visual impacts of the site and really blend it well. So, the three unit building is a big building, but uh, we, 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 we hope that it blends in well, both with our natural and built landscape of the village shell. Can you go back a few more to the sources of funding? Sure thing. There we go. So, which of those have come in, or which do you, I mean, is, is to speak to sure. where you are with that. So uh, predominantly most of these come in through the DHCD uh, rental round application. So uh, we have secured the passive house uh, financing. That was an application submitted and have received. We have CDDG money already allocated to the project. Um, the rest of these financing uh, will come in through awards through that uh, DHCD application process. Um, the, first, the first mortgage will, uh, we, have, we have like a, sorry, a letter of intent on our first mortgage. Once we're in the closing process, we'll get a uh, uh, print letter on that. Uh, the workforce, same process, we have a letter of intent on. 
And again, once the tax credits are awarded, and when, we, when that triggers the commitment letters, as well as all the state soft sources. And so the, the competitive uh, funding is the, the white Thank you. For, for some bizarre reason, I looked at the legal notices, which I never do, but some, <laughs> some and I noticed that uh, uh, CDBG is, they, I don't know, you can, who, who can best speak to this, but it talked about a fund reallocation to the Hampshire Heights playground from what's being called the Village Hill Affordable Housing Project, which has been delayed. So I, just a little, I'm sure it makes sense, but it doesn't quite make sense to me yet, sure. so somebody could tell me what, that, what that's about. We're playing both sides against them now. <laughs> So the 150 for Village Hill had been set aside, and not surprisingly, they weren't funded in the first round at the state level. So by Village Hill, you mean this particular? Yeah. The North Con. North Con. Um, and HUD does a timeliness test in May of every year, and if you don't get your money out the door, you get in trouble. So the 150 is either going to go to the playground or village hill whichever one pops first and then the july 1 allocation for 2020 will pick up whoever didn't so move. the commitment will just roll over for whichever yeah. one doesn't yeah funding is there for both and it's just a timing issue but yeah. the hampshire heights playground was not included in the action plan at the beginning of the year and if you want to do a new project and add it in you have to do a public hearing so Hence yeah. the legal aid. Okay. But CDBG has capability to fund both, so not a problem. And along those related to that, I was just curious what your budget is for the playground that you're going to be putting up since we had the discussion. <laughs> that. Oh, sure. Do you know what's on your head? What's your budget for the budget? I um, I want to say it's within the one to two hundred thousand range. Mm -hmm. But we don't have that broken down. Mm -hmm. We're happy to send it over. Yeah. We, we do have it, we just don't have it here. It's not relevant to your application, but <laughs> they it just sold the yeah. It's the same designer, though. Is it? Right. So, it looks like the construction costs have gone up about $1.7 million since the last time you came to this. Yeah. I couldn't do the math of how much it was. I know it was more than the first time you came. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about why that has gone up? And it looks like you've taken some of it out of your reserves, and the overall budget's just gone up. Sure, so yeah. What's, so what's, what's in that 1.7? So it's something we're seeing industry-wide, industry-wide, inflation and construction costs right now. Um, the 35 Village Hill Road project, I think, is a great example of this. Um, our construction costs increased about 25% on that project from when it was estimated to when we went out to bed. It's not escalation though. There's no 25%. It, 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 it right was now. a combination of escalation and uh, some assumptions that were made in the initial estimate that turned out mm -hmm. to, to not be accurate. Right, so it's, 25, yeah, it's, it's not 25% escalation, but um, mm -hmm. it's something we're seeing. I don't see the word um, contingency anywhere in this and are you holding a contingency in here i mean you don't have your bids yet mm -hmm. i don't know if like the contractor who's giving you an estimate mm -hmm. is a, probably going to be a bidder right mm -hmm. i assume i don't know but <laughs> yes. i mean do you have a contingency in there we do have an owner's contingency in every pc in the world either uh, has a line item that says con contingency or they add it to every line on you see okay. so um, so it's just not showing up in our documentation that's right. So you probably have the summary it. sources and uses, and the construction line item would have that. Okay, oh, it's, in your, it's in your contract. Yeah. And I'll just add that, somewhere. I'm sorry. Go ahead now. Um, but an estimate at a 90% drawing set um, is, is bid ready. It's, you know, it, it essentially is very close to ready um, to be constructed. So. Um, because of the timing of the mini round and you know hopefully hearing good news in mm -hmm. February we, we think that we can start you know as early as um, late next summer so 
as, as we move forward, as we advance, the amount of time between you know now and when we're starting is minimized. So there's no scope changes between this no. project and a year ago? Okay. Oh, um, and a year ago. No, not, none between now and, and next no, but summer. The, between the project that you showed us last time, mm -hmm. has you asked us for, I don't know how much, two <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what, what we also see is, and you'll know this, you start with preliminary plans as you flesh them out and add detail, you typically also incur additional costs because you have that much more information for your contractors to kind of bite into. And so definitely, I think both these projects, you have the early design and it has one set of numbers, and then you start filling in all the details and you usually some, see some escalation related to that as well. In addition to just an industry-wide ramping up that we're also seeing. And the passive house, we've talked before about the passive sure. house. Sure, well, we talked about the passive house last time. Yeah. Um, you know, again, at, there's a consultant just working on that piece. And to get to the very aggressive energy efficiency numbers needed for passive house, as you refine those details, also, you're seeing that MEP line is going to start to kick up as well. So I think it's a combination okay. so of. So, no specific work. scope changes from a year ago? It's no, just, just same concept. Yeah. Really, I don't. I can't think of any other than VE. Mm -hmm. Are you holding adults in your bid package? Mm -hmm. Can you describe any of them? Um, any major the book parts. So, uh, so is the question: Are you holding adult? Sorry, sorry. I, there's pieces of it. When you bid it out, you can you can hold pieces of it. And saying if we can't afford it, we'll cut the, this piece or that part out. <laughs> or deduct. Really. Right, so right now, for example, all the curbing along the driveway is granite. We'd like to switch that. That would be a, a deduct. Um, we, um, the community up at Village Hill, some of the owners are um, involved in a fundraising effort to add, add or pay for some of the elements of the playground. So if that if that funding comes together, um, that would come off the owner's budget. Mm -hmm. um, those are two examples. There's, um, you, you know, have to list them all. I'm just trying to get a sense of the scale of mm -hmm. the things you're looking at. Is it, is it mostly site work that's going to get this at all? Yeah. Yeah, there's not a lot in the building itself it could, um, because of our commitment to Passive House mm -hmm. and also because of our commitment to just high quality design and interior finish work that you know, we're really um, interested in reducing um, quality on. Other questions? Yeah, in this, again, a budget summary, the developer fee is uh, $1,880,000, almost $2 million, which is about 10% of the total project. The developer is community builders? Yes. And I guess I'm just always amazed, and I know there's a whole rationale for it, but so 53 units at 20 million, that's 400,000 roughly per unit, which is just, that's more to the, the scope, I'm sure, of the uh, legislation and uh, all the, the rules behind affordable housing, but it just sucks. Yep. We had this conversation, conversation about how we can. The, the thing I, I always wonder about is it's a t t over $20 million project. The C CPC funding is one point, what is it, 2%? Mm -hmm. um, if we were to give 200000 does that sink the project? As of right now, our, our budget is balanced, including a $250,000 commitment from the CPC. Um, we we are currently uh, hoping to rely on those funds to fund our project. Um, if 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 a partial award was issued, uh, we would have to do a lot of problem solving to plug that gap. Um, I, I ideally we would we would receive a full award. Thank you. We're a little over time, but any other questions? I just have one. Question that sort of relates to the whole village health project. Uh, you mentioned something about originally 15% of the units, I guess, right? Were oh, at, at the whole village yes, health site, so not just the rental. It was it was any housing involved. And so, do you know what percentage is now of market rate versus 
You know, I I don't know off the top of my head. I think it's about, I, I think it's almost 50-50. Mm -hmm. um, Talk about everything? I'm sorry, all the housing. All, all the housing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. With, with this project moving forward, mm -hmm. I think it helps to balance that. That was the original intent. Um, and I don't know how much we, we can the 15 percent and then in the decree for the development was for uh for, for uh, clients of dna yes so um that we don't have, we don't have a lot we can only report on the statistics from our own properties that yeah. we that we have support housing units in yeah. but it's just a handful i mean it's a, it's a few right, and right. How many? it's 15 percent of everything we've built yeah and i don't know about christopher heights but yeah but of the whole village hill property it's a small amount yeah <laughs> it's not 15 percent no no that yeah, could have been an offsite too it was it was an off-site number as well it didn't all have to be accommodated on site oh right right that's right and you asked this last, i think we asked this last time too but is there a is there a magic number that would provide some assurance to the mini round that there's local support. I mean, obviously we have funding constraints here. Yeah. And we'd love to, uh, well, I'm not gonna speak right over, but sure. is there a number that that you guys could quote at some kind of threshold or, I mean, or is that the number you gave us? I, it, it, it is the number, we're, we're giving you a, a real number. This, this isn't, um, we're not just coming here because I, I know that a lot of grants do like to see a match from the municipality that you're working in. We're not just coming here to check that box. Um, we, this is a real project that costs real money that needs additional funds to get off the ground. So, um, you know, we're, we're not asking arbitrarily for $250,000. It, it is what we need. Uh, we would be very uh, happy. Uh, we're happy to be considered, happy to be invited here to present to you, and, and happy to receive an award from the CPC, but, but we are asking for $250,000. It, it is a real number. And, uh, just a clarification about eligibility. The workforce housing units are not eligible for CPA funding. So the, you, it, it's only 100% of AMI. Okay. Um, so we, we, we just have to note that. There, mm -hmm. There's enough project to go around to allocate the For the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a couple other things. Uh, that we need to go through financial updates, sir. Uh, I will be sending out an updated financial report. And we still have heard. We still do not know the extent of the state funding. Is that we, correct? That's correct. We do not know. So the, the additional registry of DCs will not be reflected in our state match until next fiscal year. Um, and the CPA legislation did include for an additional um, budget surplus to be distributed, but we have no idea. Uh, but the money that we were dealing with, this that is available to us, this 946000 how did you come up with the 252000 state match? It's a guess. It's just a guess. Um, it could be less? It probably will not be less. The, if anything, it, it will be low. Good. Anything else? Okay. Uh, so the the last part of the financial piece is just to vote on the, the transfers. These are actually in tomorrow's city council agenda for reasons that I still don't understand. This is necessary to set the tax rate. So the transfers are the 172 into each? Yes. Okay. Did folks get that in the, as a, at that point today? Folks there? Okay, can we make that as one motion or do we need multiple motions? Just no, just one. So we're both voting on the estimates, correct? But that's when the, the assumption is the estimates will change. This is the thing that begins the following amounts are appropriated. Yes. Yeah, okay. so um, this is city council putting the money into accounts yeah. for you during the So we need a motion on the floor to uh, accept that uh, uh, the this amount of money be allocated to the reserve to the uh, administrative account, correct, and also to the budget reserve. Can I ask a question first? Please. I, I've asked before, and obviously I haven't retained the answer, but some of the, 
it's set up so you're appropriating the 10 percent for each of the three categories, and then you're from the remainder you're appropriating for the for the interest and principal. But doesn't didn't we decide that some of the principal at least can be counted against it? It could be the if, if necessary. Um, the calculations would be a little complicated, and given mm -hmm. the range of applications that the, the CPC gets, it, it's never seemed important to separate that. Mm -hmm. But that, that is something that we can look into for future years. So when push came to shove, and we are really committed to funding one of those uh, reserve accounts, we could perhaps have some wiggle. Okay, back to someone making a motion to uh, accept the appropriation as stated. So moved. A second. Second. All in favor? Okay. Um, Sarah, you good to go for that? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Uh, any other business not foreseen when agenda was published? I'm curious whether this uh, this 15 minutes allocation per project work, or whether we think we should have given a little more time and moved into a second night, or even gone longer. Yeah, I, I want to reflect something George said earlier. I there were a couple of questions that I would have liked to have asked that I felt I didn't get an opportunity to ask, and I'll follow up with them. But um, that was that was my <clears throat> concern. That's good. Good to know. Uh, one of the George, one of the things you missed was we were sort of debating whether to make this into two nights or one, and then thought, given the timeline that we have, to try to push it through. Push it through. Any other thoughts on that? So perhaps a little bit longer. Well, it was just that uh, I had questions about the barns at um, Historic Northampton that I didn't have prior to the site visit, so I couldn't submit them in writing. So we can get those to Sarah. Yeah. And I'm yeah. sure Historic North Hampton would be delighted. I'm sure they would put I was just going to actually call them, but um, yeah. maybe you should do it. You can't do that. That's yeah. an open meeting. All right. Okay. Sure. But, uh, if, but if you send me questions, I'll distribute them to right. the applicants and yeah. we'll send it the answers. Great. Okay. So I, I think that's a really good comment. Um, so maybe we'll just for a quick two minutes on the open meeting law, when I leave this room, I can't talk about any of this to anybody. Right? Even to you folks. Or somebody help parse that out for me. Well, I think you can talk about things. Open it just meeting. Or photographed. I don't think I can have any sidebar conversations with somebody, even my wife, theoretically, about what the discussions are or how oh, we're feeling. It's anywhere near that. It's not, it's not that strict. So you can't have ex parte communication. So you couldn't like call up Brian and say, hey, can we chat about this application? Uh -huh. Or you couldn't call up an applicant um, and talk with them separately. But, but you can certainly have conversations about things. Yeah, OK. That's not the way I understand it. So if somebody approaches me and stop and stop, and I turn, hey, we're, I hear your guys are voting on this, um, this golf course deal. How is that working out? You can you can recap the facts for them, same as you could with a planning board application. But you, but you can't you know if they ask if they start asking for your own personal opinion, then then that would be a no. Okay. In that case, they're probably going to ask about the city running the golf course because that was just a hot rumor, especially during the school negotiations. That oh, uh -huh. people said, hey, they oh, can't right. take care of teachers, but they're going to run a golf course. Right. So it's like, I wasn't uh, aware of that. Not exactly. Yeah. OK, I've had my hand slapped a couple of times for this open meeting stuff, so now I'm a little gun shy. Mm -hmm. It's well, tricky. Fine. It is tricky. <laughs> I think if there's ever, ever three of us together in public, we need to, we need to scatter. Right. So if you go to a dedication for something, which we do all the time, it's just spread out. Mm -hmm. So nobody can think the worst of us. Any other issues, questions? One quick one. There's a, uh, speaking of the CPC, there's a, a bill in the legislature right now to allow for CPC funding to be used for expansion of rail trails in the Commonwealth. So if any of you felt moved to write to your local legislators in support of that, I think it would be wonderful. 
it's another piece of kind of the recreation movement. Mm -hmm. But if anybody's interested, want to get in touch with me, I'm more. Why rail trail trails specifically? I think rail trails and bike trails, because there's some missing segments along some of the crucial corridors that, and right now you can't um, use that money for rail trails. Huh. So the, like the issue is they can't ever no, yeah. really on no, paper be permanently protected yeah. Yeah. because they could be reclaimed by the railroad at any point. So. The likelihood of that ever occurring is very small. <laughs> um, but it, yeah, there's been an interpretation that because that possibility exists, it doesn't meet the threshold for permanent protection. So what about the work that we funded? Yeah, I mean, we got extensive yeah. work on that. Not, I mean, not okay. acquisition of the corridors themselves. That, that That's the missing piece. So development into recreational assets is fine, but it's purchasing for um, permanent protection that isn't currently allowed. Huh. And we have not so it doesn't apply. No, we paved them and signed so, yeah. them, but, but we've already had yeah. access to them. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah. Yeah, all of our rail trail rails are already kind of acquired here in Northampton. This is for towns like Belchertown, mm -hmm. Southampton, pieces like that. So if you're buying it directly from Pan Am or Boston yeah. and Maine, or but on that, you know, related to that though, um, has the city has it ever come up that um, a municipality needs to place an easement on these just because they're putting money into them in case the railroad were want to take to take it back again? Uh, it's just. It hasn't come up in Northampton because there's always been a middleman. Like we we've acquired land from Mass Electric, who acquired it from the railroad, so that that link is broken. Oh, I see. Um, but no, I don't think it's there. Not here. There's another. I saw there's another bill pending in the legislature to remove the prohibition against synthetic turf fields. So someone must have a pet project in their home district. <laughs> Any other questions, comments, business not foreseen? I'll make a motion to adjourn that. Please. Uh, second? Second. All in favor? Aye.